Wonderful. Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Jordan Prutkin to speak at Medicine Grand Rounds this morning. Dr. Prutkin is, is an Associate Pro Professor of Medicine in the Division of Cardiology and Medical Director of the Electrophysiology Lab here at the UW Medical Center. He obtained his medical degree from Yale and then completed a master's degree in health sciences with a focus in clinical research from Duke. He then completed his house staff training at Johns Hopkins, followed by fellowship training in both cardiology and electrophysiology here at the University of Washington. During his time on faculty here at the UW, Dr. Prutkin has demonstrated excellence in clinical care, medical education, and outcomes-based research with a focus on pacemaker and ICD infections, as well as arrhythmias and athletes. He is distinguished as a fellow of both the American College of Cardiology and the Heart Rhythm Society. Uh, please join me in welcoming uh, Dr. Prutkin as he presents updates on pacemakers and ICDs, leaded and unleaded. Okay. Well, thank you, uh, and uh, thank you everyone for coming. Uh, the, the title is supposed to be a play on leads, um, pacemaker and ICD leads, but uh, it's probably not going over so well. Uh, I have no disclosures. Uh, so we're going to talk a little bit today about what are leads, um, where should we be putting them, and are they still needed? So just to hit some of the very basics to be sure everyone understands about pacemakers and defibrillators. So pacemakers treat slow heart rates. That's what they do. And what they have, uh, or the system, the way it's been set up for years is you have the generator. So that's this part up here. <clears throat> the generator has the battery in it. It has the circuitry. And it has this adapter or connector up here that then connects to the lead. The lead goes from up above. And it either goes, or it has, a, excuse me, a tip electrode. It has a ring electrode. Current pacemakers look about this size or so, give or take. Um, typically going up in the left chest area. They could go in the right chest area. This is the way they've looked for a number of years. Leads. So there's two types of leads. There's active fixation leads and passive fixation leads. So active fixation leads, two types of these. So there's one where you have a fixed screw. So here it is. There's a screw that's coming at the tip of the lead, and you rotate the entire lead to try and get it into place and stick into the heart. The second type, which we use much more commonly, is this extendable retractable one. So with this, the screw is inside the lead, and way out at the far end where we're accessing it outside the body, you can rotate a little part, and going all the way through the inside of the lead, you rotate it, uh, and then the screw can come out. The benefit of an active fixation lead is that it can go anywhere in the heart that you want to put it. You screw it into the wall, it'll stick there. Um, and they have pretty good, uh, what we call numbers, the threshold uh, um, impedances and such. Passive fixation leads. So these are what some of the first leads were like. So passive fixation leads have these tines on the end of them. And what happens is the lead is pushed in, usually into the RV apex, <coughs> the right ventricular apex. And those tines are there to try and help prevent the lead from being pulled back those tines will get caught, and then they uh, can't get dislodged, hopefully. Unfortunately, there is a little bit higher rate of dislodgement with these passive fixation leads, and they can only go into the right ventricular apex if you're talking about them in the right ventricle. Um, the benefit to them, though, is that there's a lower perforation rate, so you're less likely to poke a hole through the heart as you're putting these in. They also, in general, tend to have better thresholds, better sensing. Um, you get sort of the, the better numbers that we talk about. Typical lead, if you just look at a chest x-ray here, a typical system, you have your pacemaker up here, you have the lead that's going into either the cephalic vein, the axillary vein, the subclavian vein, goes through the SVC and into the heart, and here it is in the right ventricular apex. So this is a single chamber pacemaker. We can do dual chamber pacemakers where you'll also have a lead that goes into the right atrium. About 20 years ago, give or take, this concept of biventricular pacing came out for heart failure. So for patients who have a left bundle branch block, who have a cardiomyopathy, typically with an ejection fraction of less than 35%, you get this mechanical dyssynchrony of the ventricle. So here in this picture, you'll see that this person has a left bundle branch block. So this is the AV node, the His bundle, the right bundle. This is the left bundle. One of these is the anterior fascicle or the posterior fascicle. So if you have a left bundle branch block, the colors here are supposed to represent electrical and mechanical activation of the ventricles. So over here, when you have the right, vent or excuse me, the right bundle, which is still conducting, the electrical signal is going to enter into the right ventricle first. It's going to hit the septum first. 
and then it's going to take a long time to get over to this lateral wall of the left ventricle because it's not going through that super highway that is the his purkinje system. It has to go through the dirt roads of the cell-to-cell -cell connections. So this concept of putting in another lead over to the left side of the heart to try and pace the heart from these two spots to create mechanical synchrony. So when you have a left bundle branch block, what you can see is that instead of the left ventricle squeezing together, you get one wall squeezing and then the other. So they're not going together. But if you can pace the septum and the lateral wall of the left ventricle at the same time, you get those walls squeezing together. And approximately two-thirds of the time, patients will have improved outcomes who have heart failure, have an ejection fraction of less than 35%, have a left bundle branch block. They'll have improved outcomes such as mortality benefit, um, uh, improvement in, in ejection fraction, shrinking of an LV size, uh, quality of life uh, uh, improvement also. This finding a of a left bundle branch block is similar to uh, right ventricular pacing. So if you have a lead that's down here, you, in essence, are causing a left bundle branch block when you have RV pacing. Current indications for biventricular pacing are those who have an ejection fraction of less than 35%. And remember, normal is 55% or higher. So less than 35% severely decreased with New York Heart Association class 2 to 4. Have a left bundle branch block, preferably a very wide left bundle branch block with a QRS over 150 milliseconds or someone who's RV pacing over 40% of the time, um, and of course being on optimal heart failure medical therapy. And again, what these studies have shown is that over time, those who meet criteria for this uh, have a, uh, uh, here's CRT, so CRT stands for cardiac resynchronization therapy, which is a biventricular system. This is those who just have a single chamber ICD, and you have a survival benefit with CRT, um, and you also have a survival benefit with a heart failure hospitalization benefit. The newest devices that we have nowadays have what are called quadrupolar leads. So this is someone I just did last week. Um, they have their ICD up here in this left chest area. They have three leads in the heart. They have here one in the right atrium, one right here in the right ventricle, and one here over in the left ventricle. So when we say left ventricle, what does that actually mean? Because we're not going into the left ventricle. What we're doing is we're going into the coronary sinus. So the coronary sinus is the main vein of the heart, and it enters or exits into the right atrium, and it's trailing behind the mitral annulus going over to the left side. And so what we're doing is we're trying to find a branch off of that coronary sinus where we can pace the epicardial left ventricle. So in this lateral view here, you can see here's the right ventricular uh, lead here in the RV apex. And this is this lead. It's a very posterior location. It's behind <clears throat> the left ventricle. And again, what you're trying to do is pace those two locations at the same time to cause the mechanical synchrony of that left ventricle. These newest leads now have four poles on them. Here's one, two, three, four. It gives you a lot of options of which pole you want to pace from, which gives you the best threshold. If we have the best threshold, then you have the uh, best battery life for the device. One of the concerns is that the phrenic nerve can run right by here. So sometimes you can pace and actually pace the phrenic nerve, and the person complains of hiccuping with every heartbeat because you're stimulating the diaphragm. So you can try and find one of the poles where you're not going to be stimulating the phrenic nerve. Now, one of the questions is, if you have someone who's pacemaker dependent, where you're causing a left bundle branch block, and they have mild left ventricular dysfunction, not less than 35%, but 35 to 50%, should they be getting a biventricular pacemaker? So we have one study that's looked at this. Uh, this is the Block HF study, came out in New England Journal about five years ago. And you can see that there is a benefit in terms of this composite endpoint of death or urgent care visit for heart failure, that those who have a biventricular pacemaker versus right ventricular only pacing have, uh, have an improvement uh, with a hazard ratio here of 0.73. Although I tell you, I look at those curves, it doesn't look 0.73 to me, but I'm not a statistician. Um, and one of, one of the things that gets into is this concept of a pacing-induced cardiomyopathy. So we talked a little bit about this. When you're pacing from the right ventricular apex, you can cause this dyssynchrony of the left ventricle. So somewhere about 10 to 20% of patients who have RV apical pacing can develop a cardiomyopathy. 
And the question is, how do you define that cardiomyopathy? It could be a drop in ejection fraction. It could be an increase in the LV size. It could be based on heart failure symptoms. <clears throat> Just sort of one study here. This is from the uh, group from the University of Pennsylvania. So they looked at about a dozen patients who got a pacemaker. And at baseline, they had essentially normal ejection fraction, 57%. A couple had maybe um, low normal uh, findings here. But they had a normal ejection fraction at baseline, but then they got a pacemaker with RV apical pacing. And their, their ejection fraction then dropped to about 32 to 35%. Now, this is a selected group where they were taking everyone who had a drop in their ejection fraction. But what they were trying to prove is if you then add that left ventricular lead or that coronary sinus lead, then the ejection fraction went up about 45 to 47%. So there are clearly this subset of patients who developed cardiomyopathy associated with RV apical pacing. Now, this has led to this concept of his bundle pacing. So I showed in this picture here earlier this left bundle branch block. And you have this block right there in the left bundle. 40 years ago, they actually showed that the block doesn't actually have to occur in the left bundle it can occur in the His bundle itself. You have this concept of longitudinal dissociation of the fibers within the His bundle, which is just a fancy way of saying that you have fibers going from the AV node that are gonna be directed to the right bundle. This is supposed to be the anterior fascicle of the left bundle or the posterior fascicle of the left bundle. But basically, it's not that the fibers are going crisscross within the His bundle, they preferentially go from the AV node into one of the bundles, it sort of makes sense. And what they showed is that if you pace right here in this person who had a right bundle branch block and an uh, anterior fascicular block, if you pace here and there's this area of scar tissue or uh, insult into the, in the His bundle, you still develop this right bundle anterior and left anterior fascicular block. But you can pace distal in the His bundle itself still, but distal to that area of scar tissue, and you can narrow up the QRS complex, which is, to me, is fascinating. I think this is great. Um, and so it's led to this concept of His bundle pacing. So this was first, uh, they tried doing this about 15 years ago. Um, there's a paper in circulation in 2000 where they were doing AV node ablation and His bundle pacing, um, but the tools were not very good then. Frankly, they're still not very good. But if you can put a pacing catheter into the His bundle, you can try and keep conduction going through the His Purkinje system and keep a narrow QRS and maintain that mechanical synchrony of the left ventricle. And I think one of the things that's also fascinating about this is that oftentimes when we're doing this, we're pacing the ventricle from the atrium. So that pacing lead is actually put on the proximal side of the tricuspid annulus. Now, not always. Sometimes we do have to go below the tricuspid annulus. But I think that's also just another fascinating concept that you're pacing the ventricle from the atrium. So it's tough for an electrophysiologist uh, to give a talk and not show electrograms, so I apologize in advance for this. Um, so electrograms are things, electrical recordings from inside the heart. Electrocardiograms, EKGs, are what you think of from the surface. So electrograms are from inside the heart. And this is what we're looking for. So what we're doing is we are moving a lead around in the general vicinity of where we think the His bundle is. And we're looking for a signal like this. So this sharp signal, this H right there is the His bundle electrogram. So that tells us we're at the His bundle. And then you have this big ventricular signal right next to it. And what this shows here is that at this location, where you find this His bundle and you screw the lead out, when you pace from that location, you have a narrow QRS complex. So this is one of our patients or one of my patients. This is actually someone who's on faculty here um, at the university. So this was his baseline ECG. Um, so he has both six sinus syndrome and he's got AV Wenkebach. So you'll notice here, if you just look at the bottom row, this is his PR interval at baseline. It's about 600 milliseconds, give or take. You can have PR intervals that are that long. People often think it's not possible. Um, and you can see it's sort of, quote, short. It gets a little bit longer, a little bit longer, a little bit uh, longer, and then you have a drop beat. Um, and he also has sinus node dysfunction here. And he would have times where his heart rates were in the 20s or th and 30s. So this is what his uh, uh, EKG looked like. And you can see he also has a pretty normal QRS complex. 
Um, it's a narrow QRS complex here. So we did a His bundle pacer for him. This is what his EKG looks like afterwards. So you can see atrial pacing spikes here, and you have a ventricular pacing spike here, and he has a narrow QRS complex. You might think that it sort of looks like a uh, right bundle branch block, but you'll see it's sort of an RV conduction delay. Um, he has, uh, the QRS complex is still about 100 milliseconds for him. And one of the other things that, again, to me as an electrophysiologist is fascinating, is that the time it takes to get from the pacing stimulus to the QRS complex, it's about 40 milliseconds or so. So this is the time that it takes to go through the His bundle and through the Purkinje system. We talk about this being an HV interval um, if this was uh, inside the heart. So you can maintain this narrow QRS complex with pacing if you pace the His bundle. And that helps maintain that mechanical synchrony. It is a little bit of an odd location where these pacing leads go when you're doing something like this. So uh, in the PA view here, you have this uh, atrial lead that's up top here, and then you have this lead here, which is where the His bundle is in the heart, sort of in the central part of the heart. Uh, on the lateral view here, you can see it here. The lead that we currently use for this, it's a pretty floppy lead. The tools are not very good. It's actually a little bit complicated and challenging to do these cases. Um, uh, but you can see here, sort of again, it's a little bit floppier, it's a little bit narrower with this lead. Another really fascinating concept, again, getting into what we talked about earlier is, um, here's just an example from uh, a paper in the literature. So this is someone who had two to one AV block. Um, and you can see here, P wave QRS complex, P wave drop, P wave QRS complex. Um, and this would be, uh, in our world, this would be MOBITS2 or infrahissian block. The way we know that is that you can see the signal here. This is from inside the heart. You have an atrial signal, you have a His bundle signal, you have no ventricular signal. So traditionally, we as electrophysiologists would look at that and we'd say, that is infrahissian block. Probably what it is is they have a right bundle branch block at baseline, and inter intermittently, the left bundle is going out. Um, but when you actually pace the His bundle in this person, you narrow up the QRS complex. So even though the person has a right bundle at baseline, even though they have what is thought to be infrahissian disease, you can actually still maintain that narrow QRS. Now, this is one of the uh, pitfalls or one of the difficulties with this is that you can't always just pace the His bundle. Sometimes you pace the tissue around it. Um, so if you see here, um, it sort of looks, it's almost like a delta wave you sort of see here. There's a slurring of it there. Um, so sometimes you can't actually just pace the His bundle. Sometimes you get parahissian uh, tissue also. One of the things about this is just, this is a new concept and there is very little data about His bundle pacing. So this is the best paper we have so far, um, and this is one in press, so it's not uh, even in print yet. Uh, and what they looked at is those uh, who needed pacing, and they took, uh, I'm actually just going to look at this group, who had ventricular pacing of over 40%. So they took a group of people who had heart block, who needed to pace over 40% of the time, which is a fair amount. Uh, and those who had his bundle pacing, at baseline, their ejection fraction was normal, and there was no change. But those who had RV apical pacing had a normal ejection fraction at baseline, and then they, on average, dropped about seven points, maybe. I think what's more interesting, what they showed also in this paper, um, is actually outcomes. So in this group of 173-ish patients overall, um, what they showed was this combined endpoint of death or heart failure hospitalization. If you had his bundle pacing, you had a improvement compared to RV apical pacing. And especially this was seen in the group who had ventricular pacing over 40%, that his bundle pacing has improved outcomes compared to RV apical pacing. Now, one of the other questions related to this is, I talked earlier about doing biventricular pacing or CRT, cardiac resynchronization therapy. Can you do His bundle pacing instead of CRT? So <clears throat> can you put one lead in instead of doing two leads, at least if you're doing a biventricular pacemaker? So here's just an example of someone who had a left bundle branch block, had a QRS complex of 200 milliseconds. You can see this left bundle is positive in V6. It's negative deep S wave here in V1 that's wide. 
And by pasting the HIST bundle, they narrowed up the QRS complex. So again, the concept here is that that disease of the left bundle is actually in the HIST bundle and not in the left bundle itself. We don't have much data on this either. Again, one a separate paper that's in press looked at this, and what they showed was by doing HIST bundle pacing, you can narrow the QRS complex on average from 157 to 118. Your left ventricular function, so overall they had 30% that went up to 45%. If you look at the group who at baseline were less than 35%, they averaged 25% ejection fraction at baseline, and they got them up to 40% with his bundle pacing. If you had a mild to moderate uh, degree of left ventricular dysfunction, ejection fraction was 44%, got up to 55% or normalized the ejection fraction with his bundle pacing. And then if you look at outcomes, the New York Heart Association class was 2.8 at baseline, and they got them down to 1.8. Um, what, one of the things that was interesting is they took um, some of the people in this uh, study had a biventricular device to begin with, and they weren't responding, so they did his bundle pacing in them. So for that group, they similarly went from 2.8 down to 1.9 in terms of their New York Heart Association class. So one is essentially normal, no symptoms um, in terms of heart failure when we talk about NYHA class. So I think this is, um, it's fascinating. I think it's interesting. I think that this is, um, it's sort of the future, but I think there are some caveats. Um, as I've sort of been saying, our tools are not very good for this. So only about 80 to 90% of the time are you actually successful in terms of implanting a lead at the HIS bundle. Um, the procedures are longer because you need to try and find where to go. Uh, the thresholds, that amount of energy that it takes to pace the heart, is higher. So because of that, that means shorter battery life of the devices. Um, and there is a higher rate of lead revisions. So you put the lead in and it either dislodges or you start to see a significant increase in that threshold and so you have to go in and move it again. So I, I think that this actually is one of the parts of the future of pacing. Um, I think, again, we need better tools. I think we need our companies, and I actually see some of the people from the different uh, manufacturers of these devices here today to work on improving this for us um, to get better systems. All right, switching gears a little bit. Um, so this to me is, is another one of these fascinating things. This is, uh, we've seen in the device world a lot of um, evolutionary changes in devices over the last several years. Um, you know, the first pacemakers were in 1958, um, was the first implantable pacemaker um, by uh, uh, Ake Senning over in Sweden. Um, and over the years, you saw some changes in them. There were some differences in what, like, the battery was. So the initial batteries were mercury-based. Then they um, went to lithium-based. They tried that nuclear-powered pacemakers for a little bit, but there are a lot of issues with that. Um, and disposal was a big thing, plus concerns of just leakage um, of, like, plutonium in the body. Seems like a bad idea. Um, but, you know, they did make a, a handful of them for a little while, uh, back in the late 70s. Um, and so you saw these changes in pacemakers. You saw some changes in the algorithms of the pacemakers that would have these features like try, uh, methods to try and reduce the amount of ventricular pacing to make the battery life longer. Um, but this, to me, is, is really the first really revolutionary change in pacing. Um, so this is the one FDA approved. This is the pacemaker. You can barely see it. Okay, so this is the entire pacemaker. You can see up there, it is a little bit bigger than a nickel. This is the entire pacemaker. So this has the battery, it has the circuitry, and there is no lead to this. There's an electrode on the tip of it. You can sort of see it uh, uh, right there. So that's one electrode and then the other electrode here. This electrode was actually taken from a passive fixation lead. Um, so a design that they knew would work. Um, and this is the one currently FDA approved device. There is another one um, that has been studied in trials that had battery issues, and so it's not FDA approved yet. Um, but the one that's out right, <coughs> right now is called the Micra. Uh, the other one is called Nanostim. Uh, and this is the device, the way it works. So you go in through the femoral vein, 
you use a pretty big sheath to put this in. So it's a 27 French outer sheath. Um, and for the cardiologists in the room, you understand how big that is. But the sheath is, it's about that thick or so. It's about a centimeter or so thick going into the femoral vein. Um, and thankfully, the vein is pretty compliant. So you can take it up uh, into the atrium. And then through that sheath, you have this delivery tool that looks like this, that you can then advance this lead, or excuse me, this uh, system into the right ventricle. And it has these tines on it here that get themselves embedded in the myocardium. So those are actually put into the myocardium itself, as opposed to the passive fixation ones that are more uh, from passive fixation lead. We're trying to prevent the lead from coming back. These are actually embedded in the myocardium. And so here, this is what it's like to implant it. This was from my first one that I um, did uh, last year. So you are seeing the lead, or excuse me, the, um, those tines right there, and that's the implantation of the system. That's sort of how easy it is to implant this. Um, it takes about 20 to 30 minutes or so to do this. We'll just sort of see it here. You have the sheath, you have those tines that get put into uh, the myocardium. The way it works is that initially these tines, you can see, are they're straight ahead. So they're as they're in the sheath, they're pointing straight ahead. And then as you pull the sheath back, those tines get embedded into the myocardium. Now, one of the questions, of course, is, well, what's the rate of dislodgement of these? Um, so we do something called the tug test. It's a very fancy name. So there is a suture that goes through this sheath here. It attaches to the back end of this, and it goes all the way through the sheath to the outside of the body. So you pull on that suture lightly. <laughs> we had, I did a very difficult case. We had someone uh, uh, who had a post-cardiac transplant that we put these in. And for that person, their septum, because they'd had so many biopsies throughout the years, we had a lot of difficulty finding one of these. And my fellow, who was very nice, very great, um, pulled a little too hard and he pulled it out. And this was, it, it was like 12 different spots we were looking at to find this and he pulled it out and I was slightly upset. Um, <laughs> but he's such a nice guy, you can't be upset. Uh, and he was trying to do well. So, uh, so what we do is we, we zoom in uh, to try and get a good look at this. And we're looking at these tines here. Uh, so there are these four tines. And you're looking to see, are at least two of those four tines embedded in the myocardium? And we're looking like, if, for instance, you can look down here. This tine here deforms as we're pulling. And then there's a second one up here also that you can see deforms. So when you have at least two of four in place, the dislodgement rate is, uh, rate is less than 1%. Um, so that's pretty good, obviously. As is true for a lot of the device world, there has not been a randomized trial that's compared this. They used historical controls for this. So the longest duration follow-up follow for this. Uh, so this is in the blue here is the micro, and the yellow is the historical control data set that they used. And basically what they show is that there is a lower complication rate with these devices versus with a traditional uh, pacemaker. One of the other questions, of course, is, uh, is longevity. So this is a pretty small device. So uh, in the post-approval study for the Micra, it's 12 point years uh, estimated longevity on the battery. One question is, well, what do you do in 12 years? Um, and the expectation probably is you're gonna leave the old one behind and just put a new one in. The right ventricle is actually pretty big. You can put uh, at least three of these in when you look at the autopsy studies and the animal studies. <laughs> so you know, you're get yourself 36 years. It's a pretty long time. Uh, one of the things about this also is, again, we've used this term threshold here a little bit. This is a pretty low threshold, 0 0.5, 0 0.6 um, that we're seeing. So the way the device works is it, it automatically measures how much energy it takes to pace the heart, and then it paces just a little bit above that. All right, so it's not going a huge amount above it. It goes just a little bit above it. So it knows, uh, or, or, so it can extend the battery life as long as it can. Um, it also has a rate responsiveness a sensor in it, and uses the accelerometer to know that if you, let's say, um, are walking, you're exercising, you need a faster heart rate, it can do that for you. It can still pace, just like a traditional device. One of the issues is if you need to try and get this thing out. So I can't remember if this was an autopsy or a 
or a transplant, doesn't really matter. But this thing is really buried in there. Right? And you can see in this example here that those tines are really buried in there like that. That's really in there. So um, if you look at the, the studies, um, if you look at this and for nanostem, the other one, about 70% of the time it's pretty well endothelialized in the heart. So you may be able to get these out and um, you know, some of the people who are the high volume people who do this, um, especially with nanostem, talk about, oh, you know, at three to six months it's pretty easy to get these things out. Um, I'm not that sure that it's possible. Um, or at least not very easy. You essentially, what you have to do is try and snare this back end right there. Uh, but you need to try and find that, you know, buried in all those trabecula. So it's really not going to be the easiest thing. And it's really, uh, I think it's going to be one of those things, again, where you're just going to leave it behind because it's too tough to try and get it out. Well, for our current generation Micra, or leadless pacemaker, who are the best people for this? Uh, really, it's this group here. So people who have bradycardia with permanent or persistent atrial fibrillation. So if you have AFib, the atria don't need to be paced, and you don't need to sense what's going on in the atrium because you're in AFib, and you only need pacing in the ventricle. So if you have AFib with a heart rate of 20 or 30, it's really the perfect device for someone like that. Now there might be people who have either sinus node dysfunction or AV block who you decide this is the right device for. So someone, let's say, who has end-stage renal disease who you don't want to um, uh, take away one of their subclavian vein systems. If we put in a pacer or an ICD in someone who has a fistula on that side, we can clot off the fistula. Um, so someone like that you may want to do this for. Someone who has a lot of infections um, you might want to do this for. All right, we're going to skip gears. Uh, ICDs. So ICDs treat fast heart rates. So the most common thing would be that they give a shock to get someone out of ventricular tachycardia, ventricular fibrillation. Sometimes they can use something called anti-tachycardia pacing. So the first ICD back in 1980 looked like this. It has this epicardial patch, and then it had this spring electrode that went into the superior vena cava. Uh, Murawski and Maurer were the ones who developed this. Um, and over time, it then developed into these epicardial patches. So here is, um, this is the last time that we did epicardial patches at our institution for a patient of mine who had congenital heart disease. Um, so they would have two patches here that would be on the heart, and you'd have pacing wires that would allow you to um, uh, sense if someone was in VT or VF. And Here's just an example of what the initial ICDs looked like. This is not quite first generation. So this is what we affectionately call a belly box. Um, so it goes in the abdomen. Um, and um, then, again, we have these wires that went up into the heart. And then over time, the next generation devices would still be in the belly. And you'd have the wires that would go up, be tunneled underneath the skin up to the subclavian vein, and then would be threaded into the heart. Um, in this person, what they would also do uh, was put a patch in the chest area so that when it shocked, it would have a vector between the coil and this patch that would be just subcutaneously. Um, one of the things, if you look closely here on this patch, this is an old patch because it is broken. Um, and that's one of the concerns with leads, is that leads can break over time. Our current transvenous systems, here's just an example of what one of these looks like now. This is what a ICD, about the size of what one looks like um, right now. And this goes up in the left chest area, as we see there. But this concept of leads is the weakest link in the system. So this is um, a well-known study in the EP world where they looked at um, the failure rate of leads or the survival rate of, of leads. Now this included some of the leads um, that were known to have higher uh, failure rates, so like the transvene lead that Medtronic made. Um, and in their, their study, they show at five years there's probably about a 15% failure rate. Now, I think that this study overestimated things. Um, other studies haven't quite shown this. Um, but this led to the development of this subcutaneous ICD. So Gus Barty, who used to be on faculty here um, many years ago, started a company called Cameron Health, where he developed this subcutaneous ICD. And really what the idea of this was to try and prevent a lot of the lead-related complications. So this is an example. It's tough to see this here. Um, but this is someone who has a lead fracture. So this is the atrial lead on top, and you see the signal coming through here. And on the ventricular lead, this is what the native signal is doing, but there's all this extra noise here. You can see this, all this extra noise, and what ends up happening is that they get a 28-joule shock 
for a lead fracture, and that's only their first shock. They actually got five more during this episode for a lead fracture. I mean, obviously, that's pretty horrible to be getting six shocks, getting kicked in the chest repeatedly. Um, and that's just on this one episode. Unfortunately, they had even more. One of the other concerns with leads is that you can have perforation. So here's a lead that at implant looked like that, but a week later was way out there. So this person had to go to the operating room, unfortunately. So the subcutaneous ICD was designed to try and mitigate these lead-related issues. So this is from the New England Journal paper where the um, sort of described the first usage of this. So this generator sits in the mid-axillary line in the fifth intercostal space, which is what that's supposed to be. It has a lead that is tunneled outside the rib cage all the way over to the xiphoid process and then goes upwards. And when it shocks, it shocks from the can to the coil or the coin, coil to the can. So the shocking vector is like this. And sensing, if there's a little electrode here at the distal tip or at the proximal area here. So it is sensing sort of like a surface ECG to look to see if the person is in VT or VF. On an x-ray, this is what it looks like. So if you ever see these in our patients. Um, and again, it's shocking between the can and the coil there. This is the current generation system of what it looks like. It is bigger than a traditional transvenous ICD. There are some physics-related issues uh, for why that has to be. Uh, the ICDs that are um, out nowadays, they shock with about 35 to 40 joules of energy. Um, the subcutaneous ICD uses 80 joules, so it's a higher amount of energy that it needs. The people who are the good candidates for this, so really the ones who don't have vascular access, so let's say you have someone who's got subclavian vein occlusion and you can't put a traditional ICD in, you could use this. Same sort of thing I talked about before, end-stage renal disease are good candidates for this. Um, young patients. So this lead, here's an example of it. So this lead, um, you can really tug on this and it won't break. It was designed to be really robust. You could never put something like this in the heart because this would perforate really quickly. It's really firm. But when this is just underneath the skin, you can make this really strong lead. Um, those who have congenital heart disease are good candidates for this. Um, so those who, are, um, who have essentially a, a heart where you can't get into the right ventricle. Um, anybody who has risk factors for infection, I think this is a good person. But really, anybody who just needs a single chamber ICD, this is a good um, device to at least consider. Now, it's not for everyone. So someone who needs a pacemaker, this device does not have a pacemaker built into it, so you can't do pacing with it. Someone who needs a biventricular ICD, same sort of thing about the pacing. The device will only shock down to 170 beats per minute for a VT. Now, you probably don't want to be shocking someone less than 170 because they're going to be awake if they go into VT that's slow. Um, but this is not a good device for them. And then this idea of pace terminable, um, uh, which uh, we don't really need to get into. Uh, similar to Micra, there is no <coughs> randomized controlled trial of a subcutaneous ICD versus a transvenous device. This is the best data we have, which was a retrospective analysis. And what they showed was that those with a subcutaneous ICD had less lead-related complications. There was no difference in infection. I think that's going to change over time. The initial implants had a higher rate of infection because we were learning surgically how to put them in. Um, but there is a higher rate of this non-lead-related complications with this subcutaneous ICD. And again, one of the big things is lead survival. So I think what you're going to see with the subcutaneous ICD is that these leads are going to last decades, hopefully the whole lifetime for younger people. Now, it's a bigger device, so what does that look like? So on the left here, this is the smallest patient that I put this in. This was a 14-year-old who had congenital heart disease um, who weighed about 90 pounds. And it sticks out. You can see it there. Um, this is a 30-year-old who had long QT syndrome, and you can't really see it as much for him. So it's really variable. Some people see it more, some people see it less. You can um, try and put it underneath the latissimus dorsi, which can um, sort of hide it a little bit more. And more even, some people are putting it underneath the serratus anterior um, to really hide it a little bit more. Um, I'm going to make a plug for a research study, which I am looking for subjects for. Um, so made it SICD. So the made it studies you may have heard about, there's made it one, made it two, made it RIT, made it CRT. Um, so made it SICD uh, is, uh, we've just been uh, activated as a site. 
We know that diabetics have a higher rate of sudden cardiac death in those who've had a prior MI. So I'll show you a couple different studies. So this is a group of people who had, uh, who, uh, had a prior MI, type 2 diabetes. Those who had diabetes had a higher rate of sudden death, <clears throat> especially in this uh, mild to moderate um, uh, uh, cardiomyopathy group. Again, those who have diabetes have a lower survival. This is one uh, study I thought this was uh, really is fascinating. So those who have a low ejection fraction but have no diabetes, which is the solid line here, have the same sudden death rate as those who have diabetes uh, with a normal ejection fraction. And it's probably related to a diff few different features. Just in those who have an MI, you have myocardial scarring. Um, there may be factors about electrical instability, autonomic neuropathy, fibrosis, coronary disease. What the influence of hyper or hypoglycemia in this group is, is not clear. So mated SICD is randomizing patients to this subcutaneous ICD, the SICD, in those who've had a prior MI, age over 65, the reason it's over 65 is that Medicare is going to actually pay for the devices in this group. Um, so age over 65, diabetes with an EF of 36 to 50 percent. So if you have an EF of less than uh, of 35 percent or less, you already meet criteria for an ICD. So this is trying to find a new indication. And people will be randomized two to one to an SICD versus just current medical therapy with the primary endpoint of all-cause mortality. So it's 100 different sites throughout the world. Um, and where I need you is here's the patient. These patients are seen by our cardiologists. They're seen by our internists. They're seen by our diabetes specialists. And that's me. So I don't see these patients <laughs> is my problem. No one's going to be referred to me um, uh, unless you guys are helping me out. So if you have someone in your clinic, or if you see someone, if you know or just thinking about this, um, uh, who has diabetes, who's over the age of 65, who's had a prior MI uh, with an ejection fraction of 36 to 50 percent, please, please, please either contact me or contact Rachel Weber, who's my research coordinator back there, um, because we are really, um, we're looking for people. Um, all right, so in our last couple minutes, I'm going to talk about some things of sort of, well, what's the future of devices? Um, so the leadless pacer. So right now we have this single chamber pacer. So the next generation device that is in trials is um, what's called the VDD device. So VVI pacing is a device that's just in the ventricle. It's sensing in the ventricle. It's pacing in the ventricle. VDD means that it's going to be sensing the atrium and then pacing and sensing in the ventricle. So if you have someone who's got complete heart block, what it's going to try and do is see the P wave and then pace in the ventricle. But it's actually not seeing the P wave. It's going to be using the accelerometer in the device to be able to look at mechanical contraction, which is fascinating. It's great stuff. The engineers are amazing. Um, but this way, if you have someone who's complete heart block, you can use this device. All right. In the future, we're going to see a dual chamber device. Right now, you can't put this in the atrium. The atrium's too thin, so those tines are going to perforate. Um, but that is what you're going to see in the future. All right, the SICD leadless pacer combo. Of course, that has to be a future thing. So um, they've been able to uh, do this in animal models. And what they've basically shown is that you can talk from the SICD to the, uh, to the leadless pacer. Um, the design of it would be that it would allow for both bradycardia pacing, so if someone needs a pacemaker, it could do that, um, but also it would do this anti-tachycardia pacing, try and get someone out of VT in a more painless way. Um, you know, we're probably three-ish years, if not more, down the road before you're going to see um, something like this, um, but I think it's a, a really fascinating um, uh, concept. It'll also hopefully allow for better sensing. So one of the things that, uh, one of the downsides that we're always concerned about with devices and with the subcutaneous ICD um, is what's called T-wave over sensing. So it's that the device is trying to pick up the QRS complex and say that's what the heart rate is, but it's not perfect and can sometimes pick up a T-wave and double count. So if you have a second device in the heart, you can try and do a better job counting heart rates to try and prevent inappropriate shocks. All right, other things. I think this is great also, proof of concept. Um, 
so my watch, and I don't know if other people have this, I don't wind my watch, you know, just sort of the daily movement throughout the day, it winds itself. So um, they essentially were trying to make a self-powered device here. So they took actually the components of a Swiss watch and put it on, this is an epicardial surface of a pig's heart. And the energy from the contraction of the heart or the movement of the heart is used to power the pacing. So you capture a little bit of that energy. And I think this is one of the things that we're going to see going forward, um, is trying to figure out ways to capture the energy of the body so you don't have to worry about batteries as much, and at least extending the longevity of this. So if you can capture the energy of the heart contraction, or of the diaphragm movement, or just our movement of the body in some way, this way you can make the battery laugh, last in, you know, the entire lifetime. There's this concept of solar-powered devices. In Seattle, I'm, it's probably not the greatest idea, um, but, <coughs> but this is from a pig, and they put this solar-powered device under the skin to try and charge it that way. Um, and this is one of the things that, uh, in the future, I think is fascinating. Um, so this concept of optogenetic defibrillation. Um, so this is um, uh, from a paper, actually the second author on this is someone who's a, uh, a bioengineer who's interviewing here today and tomorrow um, uh, at the university uh, in the bioengineering department. So uh, if you can uh, do gene transfer and uh, what they do, this is in a mouse model so far, put light sensitive uh, uh, ion channels. And so what you see here is an animal that's in uh, ventricular fibrillation. Um, here the, they're in ventricular fibrillation and it's a uh, blue light that's given. But here they give a red light and they're able to defibrillate the heart just by shining a light on the heart and try and do painless defibrillation. So we're a few years away from this also because you, you have to figure out how do you get a light into the heart or on the heart? Uh, do you need to do a bigger surgery, like put it on the pericardial surface or go into the pericardium? And you also have to get light sensitive channels into your body. Um, but I think things like this, this concept of painless defibrillation uh, is really sort of where we are with the future. So I think the future is leadless. <laughs> When we're talking about these devices, the leads are the weak part of the system. They fail. It's a really big deal when they fail. You have to figure out how to manage them. Um, if we're not talking about leadless, we're going to talk about physiologic pacing. So either biventricular devices or his bundle pacing. We're looking at smaller devices over time. You know, right now, again, we've gone from this with an ICD to this with an ICD. <clears throat> Self-powered devices, I think, is really the future. Um, painless defibrillation is going to be the future. And then this made it SICD. So please, 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 if you have any patients, please get in contact with me. That's my email. I would be happy to see them. So thank you very much.